considering that equipment can now set cold type at the rate of around 1,000 characters a minute. Processing of the photographic paper with the composed letters on it is just a matter of seconds. After we paste up the display art, heads and copy blocks, all that's left to do is run a proof for the customer. Following client approval, the display ad goes to the photo engraving department to be made into zinc plates. The process begins with the copy camera, used for advertising art and news photos alike. Fixed to the camera platen, news photographs and advertising art are normally screened at 85 lines per inch to produce a half tone. The negative from the camera has rapidly processed and placed against a zinc plate. A strong arc lamp is used to burn the image of the negative onto the plate's photosensitive surface. All that's left is the chemical processing and the zinc plate is complete. Ready for trimming. Under magnification, the screening process that breaks the picture up into a series of dots is plainly visible. The proximity of the raised dots on the metal plate give the printed art and photographs their gradations. Now the news photos, composed story type, and display ads come together for the first time in the chase. But the newspaper page is still two steps away from press time. Using a fiber-like material called a mat, a mold is made of type and plates. The mat is covered with a blanket of cork and a sheet of steel and sent through the molder under high pressure. The finished matrix is an exact reproduction of the composed page. After curve forming the matrix, molten lead is poured to make a cast. Each of the resulting curved lead plates weighs about 40 pounds when trimmed. The finished cast, called a stereo plate, is now ready for the letterpress cylinder. As press time nears, the printers make final adjustment on the stereo printing plate ensuring that they are positioned so that the newspaper is organized properly by sections. Each day, depending on number of pages and format, a newsprint is threaded through the letterpress in a different manner. Pressmen call this positioning of paper, leading the web. story high-speed letterpress has eight units, each capable of handling 16 pages and can print over 60,000 papers per hour. Some of the largest metropolitan dailies have presses over half a block long. Depending on size and number of cylinder units, some newspaper letterpresses are capable of printing well over half a million papers per hour. The master controls are located at the center of the press. Here also is where the printed paper is folded, cut, and sent by conveyors to the wrapping and distribution area. I can tell you that uh, one of these monster presses of this type will use uh, a lot of paper in the course of the day, and we can load three rolls at a time. Our pastries are semi-automatic, and they can be changed to full press speed. Our rolls weigh about 1,800 pounds, and they're uh, 60 inches wide and 40 inches in diameter. We use about 60 rolls a day, a lot of paper to shove into the press in the course of the day. Colored paper, though more costly, is used by many newspapers check, to designate check, different check, editions. Check, 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 check. Colored ink used with increasing frequency for attention-getting headlines and advertisements.
While a press run may last only from two to three hours, several editions may have to be completed in that time. At last, the race with the clock is coming to an end. The finished newspaper is ready for the customer. A paper's readers are interested in content, quality, and timeliness. Few of them are aware of the technological and human resources harnessed to meet the hour-by-hour -hour deadlines. To the newspaper's publisher and to the key management people around him that are the decision makers, the business of meeting deadlines on a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week basis can cost large sums of money. But money isn't the only concern of publishing executives. Changing technology has made great strides in recent years, forcing new types of decision-making on newspaper management. One publishing advancement is the acceptance of the offset printing process. With the offset press, newspapers gain the advantage of improved definition, superior color capability, far cleaner operation, and above all, faster compositing time. The composing room in a modern offset newspaper is startling in its different appearance. Gone are the row after row of linotypes, chases, turtles, lead type cases, and other heavy mechanical equipment. Former hot type personnel have made an easy transition to photocomposition, learning a vast array of new skills. News stories, when they come to the new offset composing room, have already been punched on paper tape by a TTS operator. The tape has been coded for type size and style, location in the newspaper, and column width has been justified by digital computer. Inside the automatic compositor, a lightning-fast photographic type drum spins and exposes each letter in proper sequence at the fast rate of 28 lines of copy per minute. Once the story is recorded on photosensitized paper in a cassette, it's placed in a developer unit. Seconds later, the copy's ready for proofing and paste-up. Other composing room workers operate similar automated equipment that produces story heads, display ad type, and headline copy. A makeup dummy the same as used in a letterpress newspaper, indicates proper placement of copy and overall page format. With photocopy ready, the paste-up man can go to work. In okay, we're going to start rewinding here. Okay, so getting a little, started a little late, um, we've had some crazy rain that just makes it a little bit more difficult to get from point A to point B, so um, it took me a little bit longer to get started. And you know, technology is always an issue, so um, I am kind of setting things up here. All right. So we can transition over. There I am. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Skip Alzheimer. Uh, I do a thing called AV Geeks, where I collect old educational films and then show them to folks like you, potentially all over the planet, uh, thanks to the internet, etc. And um, so thanks for joining me. This, uh, this month's show is travel films, films about travel, films about types of travel, films about locations, uh, etc. Uh, I have a bunch of them. Some are promotional films, some are educational films, a wide variety of different things, so I think you'll like it. And, you know, it's it's the time to travel. There's lots of people traveling, or will be traveling for upcoming uh, whatevers. So, here you go. Uh, so what we were watching before, what I'm rewinding, is... Um, 
called Today's Newspaper, and it's a beautiful film. I haven't seen it, um, but it was a test film. Just to make sure I had my equipment working. And uh, made in uh, 1971, and back when they had letter uh, letterpress, where they um, actually poured lead type, and they had uh, lino type machines, all that. Back when it was a big deal. Instead of glorified laser printing, I guess. Um, anyways, yeah, maybe we will do a show about newspapers at some point in the future. That would be, that would be a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's start with a, a form of transportation first. Um, one of the things I like about these educational films, and actually that gets a lot of attention on YouTube, is people are kind of obsessed with different mo early modes of transportation. So trains are, are easily the most popular, but I've also know people who are into certain types of airplanes, helicopters, uh, gyrocopters, um, motorcycles, of course, um, buses. People are into buses in this film. It's popular with them. Um, it's kind of interesting to see how people traveled and how they dressed up to travel. And this film is pretty early. So uh, this is The Bus Driver. Enjoy. Every day, people ride buses to places near and far. Today, we are taking a long bus ride. Here in the bus station, we must first buy a ticket. George and his father are buying their tickets now. They are just in time, for our bus is coming into the station. It is big and powerful. Mr. Fisher drives our bus. He has driven buses for many years. This man tells us when the bus is ready. He now talks to the loudspeaker. Platform five, seven thirty coach for Somerville, Easton, Harrisburg, Bedford, Pittsburgh, and the West. Time to go. Many people are going with us. The porter puts away our baggage in a space under the seats. Mr. Fisher takes George's ticket. Inside, the passengers are finding their seats. George likes to sit in front so he can watch the driver. Before Mr. Fisher starts the bus, he closes the door and starts the motor. Then he backs the bus away. Out of the station we go, and on our way. Right on time, too. Mr. Fisher drives carefully in crowded city streets, watching out for cars and people. He switches a signal a signal to warn drivers behind him that he wants to make a turn. One last look at the tall buildings as we leave the city behind. Soon we are out on the open highway, a highway that is like a river flowing from city to city. Cars Buses and trucks roll over it day and night. George likes to see the big trucks like these, hauling all kinds of goods to factories and stores. But Mr. Fisher keeps his eyes on the road, watching the road and the other cars all the time. A 
Traffic light stops us. We will lose a minute or two here, and Mr. Fisher has to keep track of the time. Nine fifty-six. He's still on schedule. But now the stoplight is changing to go. He shifts gears. He moves ahead quickly. He still has many miles of driving to do. He knows just how fast to go on each part of the road, to keep on time and to drive safely. Now watch this driver coming out of a side road. Mr. Fisher has to look out for all kinds of careless drivers on the highway. He sees in a big mirror cars coming from behind. Here comes a car past now. And here comes another. Mr. Fisher always drives safely and never passes another car when he can't see the road ahead. Now we are riding through a fine farm country. Look there, farm boys and girls wishing the driver good luck as we roll onward. A train is coming. But we need not stop for trains. Our highway goes under the railroad through this underpass. As our bus goes on, the passengers are having a pleasant time. Some watch the scenery, others read, while others find napping the most pleasant way to travel. Look ahead, there's a car stalled on the highway. Our driver puts on the brake. Then he turns out carefully. The driver must be ready to act quickly. At last, we are coming into another city. The bus turns into a station much like the one from which we started. Here, some of the passengers are leaving us. This is the end of the trip for Mr. Fisher, too. And so George tells him goodbye. A new driver, Mr. Thompson, will take us on from here. Mr. Fisher turns over the tickets. Everything in order, Mr. Thompson is ready to go to work. Soon we are leaving the city on the second part of our trip. We cross a broad, beautiful river. Out on the road, Mr. Thompson settles to his work. In a little while, we reach the entrance to a great superhighway. On this wide superhighway, Mr. Thompson can drive more safely and more easily. And passengers can ride more comfortably, too. Cars that cross this highway have to use bridges overhead, like this one. Wide, separate lanes and well-built curves mean faster, safer driving. We are nearing a mountain ridge. It is a high wall across our path, but we plunge into this tunnel and right through the mountain. 
out on the other side, and down the mountainside into the valley beyond. Now we come to a place where the bus stops to give us a short rest. A place to stretch our legs and to eat lunch. A nice lunch room by the side of the highway. While George and his father and the other passengers have lunch, Mr. Thompson makes sure the tires have plenty of air. He looks at the big motor to see that it has plenty of water and oil. Now he can go to lunch too. In a little while we are on our way again. The passengers settle down for the last hours of the trip. Mile after mile goes by as Mr. Thompson drives on. Now we cross a valley, a valley of steel mills and factories. We're nearing the end of our long ride. Mr. Thompson's work for the day is almost over. The passengers get ready to leave the bus. Hats and coats go on. Journey's end. Mr. Thompson has driven another long bus trip safely and on time. Tomorrow, he will drive back over the same road. Now it's goodbye to Mr. Thompson and goodbye to George. Let's hope we'll take a bus trip together again very soon. So these early Encyclopedia Britannica films don't ever have like closeout music where it's like, da, 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 you know, kind of, here they go. I like how everybody's waving goodbye and uh, the comments on Facebook. <laughs> That's pretty great. Um, yeah, so if I'm not paying attention and I'm showing an early uh, Encyclopedia Britannica film, I will miss it because it will just kind of start or kind of stop. And this one uh, is one of those early ones. It has the narrator that narrates all the Encyclopedia Britannica films early on. So we're going to watch this in reverse. Because that's what we used to do when we were in school, is uh, that if we were good, the teacher would run the film in reverse. I'm running too fast, though. It's rolling a bunch. So, can't really get a decent image there. Plus, it's not fun things like people eating or... Uh, um, people jumping off the cliffs, which is hilarious to watch backwards. Um, Kevin, you just commented that uh, in most projectors it would actually be bad to run the film backwards. You are 100% correct. I've, I've made this note. Um, other screenings I've done where I've been watching a film and then right in the middle of it, the, it gets really bad, like the sprockets have torn. And I'm like, what is going on? Why did that happen? I'm like, oh, that part, the teacher ran backwards because they thought it was going to be funny. Uh, and sure enough, it's usually a visually very interesting thing. Um, but yes, very bad on film if you lose the loop. Um, and some projectors just don't do it well. So don't do it if you can. OK, what do we got here? Lots of uh, some travelogue films, um, lots of things. 
from different places. And I might have shown this another time in one of the watchathons that we did, but it's so great that I'd like to show it again. Um, a lot of these films are pretty fun. In short, so if you've seen it again, just sing along. And I'll be pulling some more films as we go, as we watch films. There's a couple that I just thought of now that I'm like, oh yeah, I definitely want to watch that. So, we'll do that. Uh, this is uh, for tourists, and it's to get people excited about visiting uh, kind of more, uh, not the hot spots in Germany. It's called This is Offbeat Germany. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, the great German orchestras, the Bomberg Symphony, the Berlin Philharmonic, the Bayreuth Festival Orchestra, are world famous. Uh, world unfamous is this jovial outfit. Let's follow them around as they greet visitors at the train station, in the harbor, and at the airport. And here on one of the steamers on Hamburg's famed Alster Lake. The city that gave us the hamburger presents the Pan Koken Capella, the pancake band. Can we interest you in some more curiosities? Fine, then come along to Anweiler. Here's a delightful anachronism in this ancient town. Instant sightseeing at the touch of a button in your own language. Many, many years ago, Emperor Barbarossa visited our town. You see him sitting there at the corner of our town hall looking down upon the marketplace with its old framework houses. A picturesque corner on the river Queich, an old water mill, and in the town hall a replica of the ancient and glorious Kaiser's crown. This town actually speaks for itself. Anweiler, Anweiler. And now we proudly present the German Federal Railroad. Well, let's say one of its closest competitors. Here's the engineer. I mean, Admiral Margaret. She races the Sail Express across a dam that stretches to the islands of Oland and Langeness on the west coast of Schleswig-Holstein. This convertible streamliner hits 100 miles an hour, when the wind is in the mood, of course. Yes, it's a traffic light, and no, it's not unusual. But take a look at this four horsepower coach, modern to the Victorian minute. The town is Bad Kissingen, a spa in Bavaria. Check the local park, Trotterjot. Where do we go from here? Well, the park looks familiar by now. And hold on as we trot some more. It looks to us as though the good old days never passed. Here we are back in Hamburg, right in the heart or should we say, stomach of this great port. We're visiting the Altona Market, the place to find that fish delish. Crowded with ships and stalls, Altona is fragrant and fun. It's a fish market, because you can fish out almost anything. Rare orchids, exotic birds, stylish hats, practical furs, exquisite jewelry, chic socks, various vegetables, flowers, works of art, numberless notions. Incidentally, if you're having a wild Saturday night, wind it all up at Altona. The Sunday only market opens at 4 a.m. and swings until 10.
Rather imposing for a small town, wouldn't you say? A museum, perhaps? Well, not really. It's the Church of Rintal in the Palatinate. It might have been a museum, though, and nearly was. The architects simply mixed up the plans. Goofed, shall we say, very grandly, 100 years ago. The columns are Grecian, the proportions classical. But if the angels don't complain, why should we? It's a lovely monument to absent-mindedness. And now, finally, that promised trip on the German Federal Railroad. A real ride on the rail, or should we say, under the rails, because that's the way they do things in Wuppertal. Incidentally, this monorail doesn't depend on pedal or even sail power. No chain wheel drive for the Wuppertalers. Electricity has been doing the job since the Pioneer system was opened in 1901. It's the most delightful transportation we know of, and it really solves the traffic problem in a graceful, high-flying fashion. In loop, after loop, after loop, after loop. Passengers, however, get dizzy and prefer to swim. This must be the trunk line. Time for sustenance. And there's nothing like soup to give you a glow. A locally famous, unique bean soup. No, those aren't beans, they're raisins. Uh, the liquid, ah yes, the liquid, pure brandy. This is a specialty of Bad Swishenan, a resort in East Frisia. And if you delicately lick your spoon clean, we'll all believe you're a native. What is this aqueous agitation? What is all the effervescence? Subterranean seltzer? Well, actually, these 204 springs are the bubbly source of the Potter River, which has its mirthful beginnings under an ancient cathedral in Potterborn, Westphalia. We have our land of laughing waters here, too, and moated castles. Monte Caolino has a fine Italian-sounding name, and, of course, it's in Germany. The Caolino refers to quartz, which is what it is through and through, and it's perfect for summer skiing. The deposit is 330 feet high and equipped with a ski lift. The 525-foot downhill slope leads right to a big swimming pool. Wonderful practice for winter sport and competition, and a great way to acquire a tan. By the way, if you'd like a souvenir of Monte Caolino, you can choose a lovely goblet made from Caolino quartz. Here we are in Mainz, where Ludwigstrasse and the 50th parallel are, well, parallel. Note the brass marker, which is blithely ignored by pedestrians. Farther south, in Freiburg, Another Ludwigstrasse crosses another parallel, the 48th, as anyone can plainly see. And nearby, the famous Freiburg Münster, one of Christendom's loveliest spires. You know, to be perfectly honest, you really can't get enough of a good gnome. And Lauterbach is where they're especially lovable and ubiquitous. This town is about 95 miles and three centuries away from Bonn. Peeking into the gnome workshops, we see that the little men are molded in clay, fired in a kiln, and dressed in bright gnome colors, including just the right touch of makeup. Along with fairy tales, they're among Germany's most popular exports. Do by all means buy a fine clock while you're in Germany. 
Let us recommend this accurate Baroque timepiece, the largest German sundial in the black forest town of saint Blasien. It's accurate to the hour, and you won't miss the sweep second hand. It only quits when the sun does, but that's as rare in these parts as our clock itself. If you can give up smoking for a few seconds, you can enjoy this wooden bridge, which spans the Rhine in the southern black forest at Seckingen. Smoking is not permitted. The bridge has borne the weight of traffic and snow and age for three and a half centuries. Today, cars rumble back and forth, picturesquely protected from the elements. And now, as a reward for not smoking, Here's a serenade by the Seckingen trumpeter, obviously a jet set type. Ladies, now you pay close attention, it's your turn. When the vanishing creams won't do the disappearing act on those wrinkles, it's time for a trip to the rejuvenating mill at Tripsdrill. The sign shows what you can expect. The cure couldn't be simpler, faster, or more fun. We simply pour them in at the top, then slide them down the hatch, and abracadabra out at the bottom, good as new. It just takes a little faith. I think we'll all have to admit, fun is really the best antidote to age. And nothing could be more fun than the water chute on the Isar River near Munich. These are actually the biggest river locks in the world, fully 820 feet long. The river drops an exhilarating 60 feet and the raft right along with it. Muscle power keeps the float on course. And a good Dixieland band provides the right tempo for a rollicking river cruise through the lovely Bavarian countryside. Definitely an upbeat, offbeat travel idea. Apartment hunting? Shop the countryside and compare. Do check the oldest dwelling in Germany, an ice age cave in the lovely Altmühl Valley. Here's the spacious living room. Note the couch. The practical kitchen. The emergency exit. Proven refrigeration. And a lovely terrace to boot. Remember, you may find more frills elsewhere, but this is rock-bottom value. With a view, of course. This is the largest barrel in the world. I excuse me, sir, you're blocking my view. Thank you. And it holds almost half a million gallons of people, which is to say 500 guests in this charming restaurant. You might guess that most of the visitors are delighted to sample the famous local wines because this is celebrated Bad Dürkheim. Note the curious native custom of linking arms. This is a sign of conviviality. The swaying has a hypnotic effect. You'll have to excuse me. Indians in Germany? Yes, and they're native German Indians, too. You'll find their teepees at Bad Segeberg in Schleswig-Holstein, scene of the annual Karl May festival. Here in a dramatic natural amphitheater, the Wild West comes to life. The West as described by Karl May, one of Germany's best loved storytellers. Yes, it's the eternal struggle of the frontiersmen. Thrilling hand-to-hand -hand combat, terrifying ambush, wild chases, stagecoach races. Will they escape? Ah, yes, but don't worry, the good guys always win. 
What audience would have it any other way? Statistics don't lie, or so they say. And there's no reason to doubt what the experts report about Munich. It's the most festival happy town in Germany. Münchners celebrate at the drop of a stein, and the local brewers are always there to put on a good show. This is the kind of oompa pa parade they've been holding for generations. Believe me, it's just one of the many fun things you can see in Munich, and it's all for free. So when you visit Germany, get off the beaten path. Your trip can be a wonderful world of colorful contrasts. Very nice. Very nice. That was offbeat Germany. I'm gonna rewind it. Um, yeah, so this was definitely something that was shown to tourists uh, to get people excited about coming to Germany. You know, they would probably, uh, some German tourism board would um, probably make this available for civic organizations for people that were interested in travel or free entertainment at their different meetings and there were lots of them so you know the Kiwanis Club could potentially uh, rent this film for just the cost of the postage um, it would show up and then they would have a delicious dinner and then they would watch this is offbeat Germany um, it might be shown on television early television or television from the 60s. But, um, yeah, I love films like this. This is showing us all the cool, potentially cool things. And it's very much an ad for uh, Germany. I feel like that monorail was in uh, Fahrenheit 451, but I could be wrong. The movie Fahrenheit 451. Uh, so, yeah, uh, tonight we're watching 16mm films of... Um, of travel and if you can see behind you we're actually watching them live like we're using a telecine a film transfer machine and we are that's going through the film is going through here and then it's going through a bunch of cables and it's being converted to an HDMI signal and then it's being converted to MPEG-4 and then pumped via the internet to servers all around the world um, so you can watch it on YouTube, uh, Facebook, or Twitch. All right. Next, we're going to have a televisit. There's a little tiny cans. Little tiny films. And this is meant to be shown on television. Uh, made by a Canadian company. The Canadian Travel Film Library. So, here we go. Very taped up. Alright. And of course, I'm showing films about travel because people have been traveling this summer uh, and will probably be doing the last little bit of traveling uh, before Labor Day in the US. Um, so, it just seemed appropriate. And I have, you know, lots, scores of films that could potentially have been candidates for this. Um, so, kind of going through, changing things up, running in the back, pulling some films. All right. So, this is. Um, televisit ice fishing time in Quebec.
St. Anne de la Pérade. It's a quiet French-Canadian town that's vividly transformed at the end of December every year when they haul the cabins down to the frozen river. Before long, a whole village of cabins is laid up. But before each cabin is put in place, there's a hole cut in the ice. That's most important. Cabins are gaily decorated and the spirit is festive for this is the annual Tommy Cod Festival. The river under the ice is swarming with little fish and you simply sit in your cabin and haul them up. All you need is some bait, frozen pork liver, and some patience. When the little stick on the line wiggles, you know you've got a bite, and you haul it up through the floor. Tommy cod are a saltwater fish that spawn up the St. Anne River 700 miles from the sea. Late in December and in January, there are millions of them here, and their presence attracts thousands of fishermen. At modest rates, you can rent snug, heated cabins for a few days' sport. And you can join in the fun that goes with the Carnival of the Little Fish. Carnival time in St. Anne de la Pirade, Quebec. All in honor of the Tommy Cod, the little fish that brings a unique kind of sport to this French Canadian town every winter. So I really, really, really like that Tommy Cod. Um, let's see if I can get back to it. That's right there. That Tommy Cod costume is pretty awesome. Um, having dressed up as a fish for a local parade in uh, rural North Carolina, um, seeing that costume is, I want it. So, if you ever figure out a way to, to find a Tommy Cod costume, just let me know. Yeah, so, wow, it's a particularly noisy reel. I have to hold this so that it doesn't rub against the plastic, the short plastic. Some of you archivists out there are probably going like, dude, you need to put that on something, a core or something. Um, but you might notice we're not doing white gloves, we're not doing cores. This is Gonzo film present presentation. So we don't know what's gonna happen. Something might burst into flames. Something might explode. I might get a splinter. You don't know. We just don't know. Where's that other thing? All right. So uh, I showed we showed an early uh, '40s film, '40s maybe '30s even, about bus driving. Um. And so uh, that's one form of transportation. I wanted to show this form. Um, it's great to watch this uh, nowadays because things have radically changed. Well, not radically changed, but they've changed pretty significantly uh, in how we do this. Um, I don't know if you noticed, even in the bus driver uh, film, how people dressed up. They wore suits and dresses, and you know, the little boy was dressed up nice. Compare that to Greyhound now, very different experience. 
Um, but, you know, people used to dress up when they traveled. And um, that just does not happen anymore. All right, so this is air transportation. And this is a, um, it's a vocational film. It's uh, trying to get people to figure out what they want to do uh, with their lives. And this was made just after World War II. So there's a lot of people mustering out of the service, trying to come up with ideas like, well, how am I going to make money? And what's my new career or you know, job occupation going to be? So here we go. This is uh, air transportation. The airplane, symbol of our mastery of the skies, is spanning oceans and continents in ever-dwindling hours, bringing new hope to the people of the world, new horizons to industry, and new careers to youth. For air transportation has proved itself a vital factor in the social and economic life of modern civilization. It is a rapidly expanding industry embracing many trades and professions, and industry employing thousands of persons. For example, to keep each airliner in the air today, over 100 workers are needed on the ground. Many of these are engaged in office work. This number, the reservations department, comprises a specialized group. It is here that flight schedules, rates, reservations, and related subjects are communicated directly to the public by telephone. The work is interesting, but requires tact, sales ability, and a pleasant, well-modulated voice. Another reservation's job is at the ticket counter. Here, however, the duties include the actual issuing of tickets through direct personal contact with the public. As in many departments, the work is handled in shifts, for around-the-clock service characterizes the industry. The welfare of the passenger is of paramount importance. To care for his needs, men known as transportation agents are employed. Well trained in government and airline regulations, they have often gained their experience in previous jobs such as cargo agents, reservations representatives, or similar work. Through on-the-job training, they learn how to prepare flight movement reports and coordinate the dispatching of passengers, mail, baggage, and freight. Transportation agents also contribute to the safety of the airline operations by determining the proper weight distribution of cargo. The operation of an airline requires countless messages in order to coordinate all departments. This is generally done by teletype and radio. Many of the teletypists are women, a large number of whom obtain their training in commercial schools. Accuracy and speed, as well as a knowledge of airline codes, is necessary. Although important, their work does not require the extensive training demanded of the radio operator. In addition to operating, he must be able to maintain and repair radio and telephonic equipment. He must hold a radio telephone second class license or better issued by the Federal Communications Commission. The radio operator keeps in close touch with planes in flight, advising them on such things as operational details and weather conditions. Using weather balloons and various recording devices, the United States Weather Bureau gathers nationwide climatic information and sends it via teletype to airlines throughout the country. The information is then charted, analyzed, and interpreted into weather forecasts by the airline's meteorological department. This work requires specialized college training and unusual accuracy and judgment. But the key figure in all flight operations is the flight superintendent. He is the man who decides whether the planes will fly or not. He releases all planes on his division, follows their progress in the air, and keeps the captains or pilots advised of conditions affecting their flight. The flight superintendent, together with the captain, plans each flight in detail. This exacting work calls for a pilot who is also a qualified dispatcher, certificated by the Civil Aeronautics Authority. In addition, he must have an accurate knowledge of communication facilities. His responsibility is great, for he coordinates all flight operations to achieve these objectives, safe, swift, and dependable air transportation. But the safety of operations also depends upon the proper maintenance of planes. 
For this reason, many skilled mechanics must be employed. Their work is highly specialized, and those who direct or supervise such work must hold a federal government certificate and rating depending upon the type of work they do. For example, mechanics qualified to supervise work on general maintenance, including dismantling, welding, or fabricating, must hold what is called an A, or aircraft certificate. Others, who supervise and approve engine work only, are required by the Civil Aeronautic Authority to hold an E, or engine certificate. But no matter what their chosen field may be, for equivalent technical schooling is required. However, planes need more than mechanical attention, for they must also be washed, cleaned, and polished. This general utility work calls for no special training and is done by fleet service helpers. Thus, only through regular and thorough maintenance can the airlines provide the service and schedule upon which the passengers depend. The arrival and departure of planes is regulated by dispatchers in the control tower. These men serve as traffic coordinators, keeping congestion at the field to a minimum. They are employed by the federal or local government and must hold a certificate which signifies their knowledge of air traffic regulations. For those young men who enjoy working out of doors in all kinds of weather, there are opportunities as ground crew members. Fast work in refueling and servicing of planes is required. Ground crew men, as well as cargo handlers, need little training, but should be able to maintain simple records. Cargo handlers must know how to load cargo properly, according to its destination. In other words, what comes out first should be loaded last. Yes, there are many workers essential to air transportation, but throughout this number, the flying crew is perhaps the most colorful group of all. An important and familiar part of this crew is the smiling hostess or stewardess who anticipates the needs of every passenger. A hostess must be a person of charm as well as capability. To qualify on most airlines, she must be healthy, single, and between the ages of 21 and 28. She must be between 5 feet 2 and 5 feet 6 inches in height and of normal weight. Girls who are accepted receive special training in the rudiments of flight regulations, air routes, meteorology, and aeronautics. To be eligible, at least one year of college or three years of equivalent business experience is necessary. A knowledge of foreign languages is becoming a definite asset with increasing worldwide air routes. When the passengers are aboard, the ground crewmen clear away all service equipment in preparation for the takeoff. One by one, the huge engines roar into action as another giant of the air prepares to thunder down the runway. Many workers in all kinds of jobs have coordinated their efforts to make this flight possible. But without the skill and knowledge of the pilots, the plane would never leave the ground. These men with wings represent but a small number of all airline employees. Their qualifications are high. Perfect health is essential. They must have hundreds of hours in the air and an intimate knowledge of aeronautics and related subjects. The competition for this work is extremely keen and only those with unusual ability and experience can expect to find employment. The majority of job opportunities are to be found in airline passenger service. However, freight and air express services are expanding rapidly to meet an increasing demand for swift transport of medicines, perishable foods, furniture, and hundreds of other products. And in the future, this branch of air transportation will offer employment possibilities for pilots, as well as many others. But opportunities in air transportation are not restricted to large airline organizations. Many small companies and individuals maintain private planes, providing transportation or feeder service between local points. In work such as this, there are jobs for pilots, field managers and airport engineers, mechanics and helpers, CAA control tower operators, link trainer instructors, flight instructors, and many others. But the need of training and education for the better positions and higher paying jobs cannot be overemphasized. Colleges and specialized schools throughout the country 
maintain facilities for teaching different phases of air transportation. The armed forces offer exceptional opportunities for young men to acquire skill and experience in many aviation jobs. Technical books, trade magazines, and government publications provide current information and trends in air transportation. And airlines from coast to coast maintain training programs for all types of work vital to this expanding industry. But obtaining employment will not be easy. Competition for jobs is great, and the total number employed is comparatively small. However, the industry makes up for this by the variety of jobs it offers. Individual qualifications are a deciding factor. And if you want to learn and earn your living in a youthful and romantic industry, air transportation presents a challenge and an opportunity for your life work. Exciting. Radically different, man. Just to see the people um, get on the plane. I mean, that's the thing is, you know, back in the day, you used to buy, you could get on a plane and you would buy the plane ticket while you were on the plane. Just like on a train, you can do sometimes. Um, so there wasn't really any of this, like, reservations, and you just had to show up and um, everybody dressed up and um, food was nicer, everybody was nicer, it was more expensive, I'm sure. But um, yeah, it's, I, I love watching, watching films like that. Um, it's, you know, the educational films are certainly corny and funny sometimes, but also they're like, oh wow, that's, that's how we used to do things. That's a little uh, cultural artifact of that. Another cultural artifact is things that are actually found in these cans. And um, so this is something that says, do not rewind after last screening, leave and showing. So, um, some of you who handle film will run across these and there are scores. There's so many different versions and variations on that. I have one, there's this little bear it has a holding a little stop sign that says stop, do not rewind. Um, the reason being is that um, they did not want uh, people who really just barely understood how to run a projector to um, rewind the film because they were afraid they were actually going to run it through the projector instead of on top. Uh, also, not rewinding it allowed them, uh, when they got it back at the uh, library or archive or whatever, a distribution center, they could check the film to see if there was any damage. Um, and um, then charge accordingly if, if they had to. So do not rewind. And I know that the, you know, I actually saw, I went to a screening at a church where they showed the burning hell, and I saw them actually try to rewind the film back through the projector. So, you know, that thing that we were talking about earlier about yeah, don't run films back through the projector uh, in reverse because it'll tear the film apart. That's what they were beginning to do, and I, like, jumped up. I tried to keep my cool, and I jumped up and was like, no, stop, stop, you're going to damage the film. So I showed them how to, like, loop it out and then just have it run above. So there you go. I saved that copy of The Burning Hell. Okay, we're going to do a... Um, I have three... I probably have four. I have more than that, but this is what I got here. This is what I pulled. We've got three destinations. This is part of a New Horizon series featured by the up-and-coming um, awesome international um, airline, Pan Am. So we have three destinations, and I'll let you guys vote online. Okay? So we'll watch another film before we watch that, but now I want you to vote. So the choices of where we're going to go to are uh, Uruguay, India, Ireland. So you have an, a choice of one of three. Uruguay, India, Ireland. So you make the choice and type it on uh, the comments on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch. 
Uh, actually, don't type it on Twitch because I don't look on Twitch. So figure out some way to communicate with me. Um, maybe call me on the phone. Um, so yeah, Ireland, India, or Uruguay. So figure out where you want to go, and we will go there. In the meantime, as you vote and you figure out, you chime in what you want to see, um, we're going to go back to Canada and visit a spot that I've actually been to and I'm sure lots and lots of people went to. Um, in fact, I know lots and lots of people went to because when I transfer people's home movies, this is one of the places that they go, um, invariably, and that is Niagara Falls. And this is the Canadian side of Niagara Falls, which is the more awesome side. The American side is not as visually breathtaking and is depressing, very depressing. The Canadian side looks awesome, has a casino. No, wait, it doesn't have a casino. Looks awesome, um, has wax museums uh, and ha haunted houses. So I totally recommend going to the Canadian side of, of uh, Niagara Falls. So anyways, here it is, another televisit, uh, Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, Canada's most popular tourist attraction. They come from around the world to see the awesome spectacle of 35 million gallons of water cascading down every minute. It's almost a century and a half since tourists started coming here in large numbers. Nowadays, there are an estimated 8 million visitors a year. As always, a trip aboard the Maid of the Mist below the falls is a favorite excursion. And as always, Niagara Falls is a mecca for honeymoon couples. For visitors, there are many vantage points from which to view the falls and the churning Niagara River as it makes its way to the sea. One of the most breathtaking views is from the famous Spanish Aero Car as it swings high above the river's great whirlpool. In the river's gorge, the water that pours through is the drainage of a quarter of a million square miles of North America. But besides natural wonders, there are other attractions for visitors, like the duty-free shop that caters to tourists from the United States, and the observation towers, from which you can see the skyline of Toronto on a clear day. There are fine gardens throughout the Niagara area, and one of the highlights is the floral clock made up of 24,000 colorful plants. All in all, a great array of sights to see at this most popular of Canada's tourist attractions, Niagara Falls. X's are short, I forgot. All right, so I'm gonna rewind the film here. 
Let me turn this off so you don't hear the chipmunk. All right, now's your last chance. Do you want to go take Pan Am to India, Uruguay, or Ireland? Now is the time. I don't think anybody on YouTube is actually chiming in. So we'll have to do a, a quick tab tabulation while I... Um, so I will not be here. You'll just see me take off. Whoop. You get to see the bear Talisini just sitting there. All right, let's see what we got here. Okay. All right. Okay, so... to India. Alright, so. I got this from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Library. Um, they tend to do an annoying thing where they just cut in the middle of the credits that it their little title screen that says Charlotte Mecklenburg Libraries, or courtesy of Charlotte Mecklenburg Libraries. So we'll see where it appears in this film, but it has a, it's kind of an annoying habit. I don't know the reasoning behind that. I've never seen anybody else ever do that, so it's, it's really kind of frustrating. Anyhow, all right, so here is Uruguay. New Horizons Uruguay. This is a focus leader. Do your movies look like this? Do your soundtracks sound like this? Or like this? If so, you need this. A focus leader. First, set your lens so that these lines are sharp and clear on all parts of the screen. Now, set the volume control on your projector. The sound level should be adjusted until my voice can be clearly understood in all sections of the room. You are now ready to participate in another Pan American Travel Adventure. That was awesome. A Spanish sailor saw this mountain from afar. Monte Viteu, he cried, meaning, I see a mountain. And to this day, we know the capital of Uruguay as Monte Video. Uruguay, between Brazil and Argentina, is one of the world's purest democracies. The traveler making the grand tour of South America is well advised to pause, to take in the easy, congenial mood of Uruguay's metropolis.
Christmas in summertime. South of the equator, the green Christmas is as traditional as the white Christmas in northern lands. If the man can't go to the cafe, the cafe will come to the man. Coffee will be delivered any time, any place. But coffee is not Uruguay's national drink. That honor goes to mate, the tea made from an herb. The way one takes it is through a silver straw. One feels comfortable in Uruguay. The country is good-natured without being light-headed, intelligent without being ostentatious. Although outwardly a leisurely pace, Montevideo packs and processes meat, catches and cans and freezes fish, ships wool and grain and beef to scores of distant nations. The plaza, named for the national hero, Jose Gervasio Artigas, the father of Uruguayan independence. Uruguay's presidential palace houses the hemisphere's only government headed not by a man, but by a committee of nine executives. If Uruguay's 19th century was turbulent and divisive, her 20th century has been stable and utterly democratic. Her people are mostly of European descent, primarily Spanish and Italian, but also British. Soccer is the game here, as it is in most of South America. The country has a multi-party political system, which makes the Congress a forum for true democratic competition. Inside the congressional building, some 30 kinds of marble from the famous national quarries. A woman's head is one of the random forms of the texture. George Bernard Shaw, or so they say. Of many years of hardship, a single moment is frozen in time and stone. La Careta is one of the America's great monuments. It honors Uruguay's pioneers. Antique wheels are an elegant way to go to the beach. The beach is the front yard for the capital's one million people, who comprise in themselves one third of Uruguay's population. Tradition dies hard. Antique cars are held in high esteem. And the auctioneer has a full attention to the audience. First impressions can be wrong. This is not a barrel of beer. It is literally filled with semi-precious stones. The agate. The amethyst. The amethyst and the topaz are embellished, of course, by the jeweler's art. This is not a dollar sign, it means pesos. The price is much less in dollars. Another Uruguayan specialty is fur. The nutria is not bred on farms, but captured in the wilds, making, they say, for better fur. A coat of red antelope is another bargain worth looking into.
Nutria comes in white, too. Another item of affluence at a fraction of its price elsewhere in the world. Just outside Montevideo, the cattle country begins with its typical ranch homes or estancias. This is a common sight. The nest, shaped like an old-fashioned oven, gives the oven bird his name. This is one of the world's most truly pastoral lands. Not only meat, but hides and wine, too, are products of the rich countryside. The gauchos here are the genuine article. The way they dress, the way they are, has nothing to do with tourism. So strong is the gaucho imprint on the Uruguayan nation that big city types from Montevideo dress in the traditional costume of a Sunday. A gaucho's full regalia. Another Uruguayan mood at Punta del Este, a haven for writers, artists, and socializing types from all over. Punta del Este is but two hours from Montevideo by car, half an hour by plane. The beaches stretch for miles. Good places to store up energy for the casino, polo, the regattas, the film festivals, the deep sea fishing, and all the other fun and games of those who find Uruguayan prices and seascape an irresistible combination. Montevideo at night. The traveler with a taste for new horizons will like Uruguay. There's a sense of belonging here. Many residents of Uruguay are multilingual. Spanish, of course, is their native tongue, but many also speak English, French, and other languages.
time in Uruguay. Pent-up emotions finally unleashed, gay abandon, and the sheer joy of living. This goes on until dawn and lasts a full week. That was just awesome um but you guys saw what i meant about how like right before the ending credits they the library sticks in this really annoying little title card let's see if i can rewind to it it's so obnoxious Ugh. so infuriating <laughs> All right, we're going to watch everything in reverse for a little while. All the dancing and the singing. Big fan. Um, I forgot that these uh, films were in such beautiful... Um, um, condition. They used low-fade film. Because um, they cared. They, they wanted there to be color integrity. And these films... Uh, this one was probably made in 65, 66. Um, stunning color compared to offbeat Germany, which was probably a late 60s, early 70s, which was super, super red, where the, the uh, stock faded, color stock faded. All right, so um, let's see. I think I'm going to show India. I mean, there, I got a lot of votes for Ireland. I know I'm going to... People even texted me. I didn't even know that there were emojis for Uruguay in, in Ireland. I had no clue. So that's hilarious. Uh, I want to see what they do in India. I'm just interested to see what the, the hotspots are there. Um, I think it'll be fascinating. Ireland, yeah, somebody suggested that we show it um, for a St. Patrick's Day event, which, sure. I could do a whole Ireland show. I think it'd be kind of fun. Um, but yeah, somebody commented on the leader, the Pan Am leader. It was that was pretty awesome. The sound and the focus leader. Um, there's only a couple of other companies that really do great leaders. Um, there's some McGraw Hill ones that are pretty good about adjusting. Um, you used to be able to adjust the sound position, and so they were they'd come up with this test where. Um, it would you would try to match the beep with the flash and if it didn't match then you would adjust it back and you know it was a way to kind of deal with these sound projectors that were adjustable um, or probably where you had a loop where you needed to go one above or one below um, so that was pretty good but this one it sounds like mr magoo but i don't know we'll see maybe it'll be on this one too on uh, india but um, I'm excited to see India in beautiful color and hip 60s. Maybe we will see some Nehru jackets. That is what I'm hoping. All right. So here's India.
modern jet clipper arrives in an ancient land, India, unlike any other country on Earth. In store for travelers are unforgettable surprises. As modern as the cities may appear, there is still a mood of the ages, an aura that casts a spell and carries the newcomer over centuries in time. For here were well-planned cities with buildings of brick 7,000 years ago. In Calcutta, Bombay, Delhi, in cities large and small, you sense a holiness of the Hindus and a sacredness of their homeland, where a spirit from the past is creating progress in the present across the nation. You begin to feel the mysticism. You realize you're off the well-trod tourist trail. You're in a unique civilization, one of the oldest in the life of man, among the largest of all countries and one of the most populated, one-seventh of the human race, 438 million people. Feel the mood in the Jama Masjid Mosque in Delhi. Across a belt of green lawns is surely one of the noblest buildings in India, begun in 1650 by Shah Jahan as a mosque. An insight into the people of India must include a voyage down the Ganges. Besides using the river for transportation, they use it for cleansing the body and spirit. Humble believers ponder the divinity of the Ganges, meditating for hours, days, years, detached from body, nation, the world, seeking God's greatest gift. They simply ask for goodness. The river is also significant to the famed Indian elephant, providing a pleasant interlude to a powerful beast whose skin is thick but sensitive to the sun. Like stepping out of prehistoric times, the mammoth pachyderm is a valuable tool in the hands of diminutive man. The elephant's seeming ability to understand is one of the wonders of nature. The placid Indian is deserving of this four-footed tractor and has gained the reward through character and goodness. For the secret to training the giant is time, patience, and kindness. Not only in the timberlands, they also help out with the tourist trade. With a minimum of spoken commands, the driver steers with his feet. A proud picture to show the folks back home is a photograph taken from an elephant's back. If you don't get rocked to sleep, this is a good way to see the sight. Well ahead is Amber Fort. Here was the capital of the Ur, with a hall of mirrors and by panels of alabaster with the finest inlay. Beauty is a part of their way of life, expressed in their woodcrafts. Perfection is a form of goodness, and in the Hindu faith, the person who follows goodness in this life will be born again in a more exalted position. His products are collector's items across the sea. At the potter's wheel, we also find the mood of India well expressed. Deep concern over a mound of clay describes an artist, not a mere craftsman. India's arts and crafts have always been a prize abroad. With an instinctive feeling for symmetry, infinite patience in the background of centuries, the Indian produces goods of rare excellence.
But what part does the elegant sari play in the character of India? Besides having widespread popularity with visitors, the versatile sari originally reflected a reverence for motherhood, the main purpose in life for an Indian woman. Draping her in the colorful garb is supposed to clothe her in purity and chastity. More up-to-date reasons are dignity and glamour. Different drapes typify specific sections of the subcontinent, but a woman can wrap it in various styles to suit her mood. Even in the dance, there is the traditional reserve and restraint within the performance. Using the ideals of discipline with mental and physical welfare are progressive educational programs such as this on display in Delhi. <laughs> Reminiscent of days gone by, the horsemen of the palace guard drill in precision. A peaceful, independent Commonwealth nation, India takes pride in her mounted soldiers, brigades which won glory in famous battles of history. The whole world has read the adventures of the Bengal Lancers. An exacting contest is tent pegging, a hard, fast ride. A dangerous stab for a tiny stick. He got it. The coordination and timing must be perfect. Will this Lancer get it? Ah, oh, he missed it. Too bad. The game's as old as the cavalry and as popular as ever in India today. Throughout the ranks, there is an air of nobility. There is also an unswerving dedication to the new nation, independent since 1947, like yesterday in their long past. A history which saw the Hindu religion appear in 2400 BC, the Persians in 500 BC, Alexander the Great in 300 BC, Vasco da Gama in 1500, the British in 1750. Can ornate structures of another age Tell us of a people today. In Kajuraho, ancestors show similar fine detail in artwork, which reveals the same deep love between man and wife that exists in their present day society. At the Palace of Breezes in Jaipur, you see an exquisite example of elaborate and fanciful architecture. But the people themselves remain ultra conservative in their personality. The buildings of Fatapur Sikri were constructed over a period of a century and a half, from 1556 to 1707. Though Agra blossomed forth during the reign of Akbar the Great, the true measure of his eminence is the imposing stone capital built by him in Fatapur Sikri. Twenty-six miles from Fatapur Sikri is Agra Fort, a mile and a half in circumference of almost unbroken masonry with glistening towers. A palace fortress, the rusty red structure with white domes, encloses many relics of old splendor. But a Agra's world fame is due mainly to a radiant structure described as the most beautiful of man's masterpieces. 
caught in the mood of the romantic Taj Mahal, renowned as the poem in white marble. We might imagine the words of its inspiration. Beauty is love, love is beauty. For it was a man's adoration for a woman that produced this jeweled edifice three centuries ago. An Indian ruler's undying love for his wife, Mumtaza Mahal. Now timeless, ageless, the Taj Mahal belongs to the whole world as a monument to love. Oops, the film broke. One second. <laughs> Yeah, this we're gonna forego this one. This one has some a couple of bad splices in a row, and um, requires some work. I do not inspect these films before I run them, which you know you're supposed to do, because um, it's half it's half the fun. Um, you know, I certainly won't run something that is super super damaged or obviously damaged, but this is kind of oh man, then that splice broke. This is just falling apart. Holy cow. It's like, I don't know what they did, but somebody, the thing just fell apart and they did these really crappy cement splices to get it back. So, um... Yeah, so anyways, I have to re-thread this. That's a disadvantage of this Telecine, which is it doesn't use uh, perfs to, to uh, go through. Uh, it actually, um, wait a minute, I'm a little discombobulated, right. Um, it doesn't use perfs, it uses tension, and when it loses tension, then you have to kind of go through all these rollers and make it all work. And right, um, which is why you know if, if the sprocket hole is damaged or if it's shrunken, you see the image roll instead of chatter. Um, so that's a allows you to kind of see the film without damaging the film anymore. But um, all right. So we're going to rewind that. All right, so that's um, Kevin Kilborn wrote Rotating Prism. Um, no, actually not a rotating prism. That's um, other folks use that. This is actually a, um, there's a camera here. There's a mirror. Then there's a uh, LED thing that pulses. And so it measures the, where the sprockets are and then does a trigger based on that. So if it's if it misses the trigger, then it damage rolls a little bit. There you go, more than you would ever want to know about that technology. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of votes um, for, wow, it's like, it's almost up down the middle. Um, I'm gonna have to do another tally here, but we'll, you know, We'll figure it out before the end uh, of the screening. What time is it? 42. Okay. I'm going to show a film that people tell me is rare. I didn't realize it was. Um, I just have it. Um, it is 
I got it from a school teacher in upstate New York who had a bunch of films at his house that he rescued from the dumpster at, the, at his elementary school. And then his wife said, you need to move these. So he found me and then uh, drove them down. So that was pretty exciting. Um, this film is by Saul Bass. Saul Bass, you know, graphic designer, who uh, designed lots and lots and lots of awesome uh, intros, cred credits for movies, um, movie posters. Just was really just the go-to person, and also directed a crazy film about ants called Phase Four. Um, which I'm excited that we will show at some point at the Alamo Draft House. I know we're destined to do it. Um, anyways, so he did this film. It's a promotional film for TWA, Pan Am. It's, it's for one of the airlines. Uh, and it is called uh, From Here to There. So, enjoy.
Saw bass. That was pretty great. Pretty awesome. Let me turn this down. Yeah. So the film is uh, shrunken. Uh, you know, it was made for United Airlines or United, yeah, Airlines. And um, it was probably a promotional film, but it was also, you know, there was a time when people would, they would hire um, filmmakers to kind of do these kind of light takes on whatever. I feel like a friend of mine who works at the uh, Warhol said that Warhol was brought in 
and Xerox. Xerox or maybe like Excedrin. It was like some big corporate place and they're like, oh, we're going to have Andy Warhol show a day in the life at our whatever. And it was... You know, it was just, they threw a bunch of money at it, and I'm sure that they showed it uh, at United Airlines sh shareholder meetings, and they showed it whenever there was like kind of a fun, interesting thing. It's it's not obviously a promotion for United Airlines; it's more about the wonders of air travel and all that. Um, and it was distributed to the schools. I got it from a school. Pyramid Films distributed it, so it had some sort of bigger appeal. Um, but yeah, it was fascinating. Fascinating. So, um, I did a count. Some of you didn't really just could not pick. You had to give me some sort of weird variation on the two. But, um, I think we're going to go with astronauts. I think we're going to watch astronauts. Nurses, we're going to do another time. I got some pretty crazy nursing films. Um, and astronaut films... I got some pretty interesting stuff that I think I think you might like. Um, so, thanks for making that choice, and also thanks for making the choice to watch AV Geeks tonight. Um, we know you have literally millions of other options online, and we appreciate that you chose uh, AV Geeks for your evening entertainment. Um, if you like AV Geeks, there's ways you can support us. Uh, one is tell your friends about the next time we're doing a show. Uh, either uh, via the internet or um, live. So the next live show I'm doing is going to be at King's uh, on Tuesday. And we're going to do a show called Don't Worry, Be Happy. It's just films to tickle your brain. To just because you got a lot going on in your life. There's a lot that's making you sad, it's bumming you out, it's worrying. So I'm just going to show films that are just brain candy. Just like, ah, oh, relax, enjoy. There might be a deeper meaning, but really who cares? So that is at King's, uh, 8 o'clock on uh, Tuesday. Then the next show that I'm doing is kind of, well, I won't actually be here for it, but... Um, my good friend, Kat Schechter, who used to program films with Oddball, uh, who now also is programming uh, at the Alamo Draft House in Raleigh, she is going to do a stop-motion animation show uh, because she loves stop-motion motion animation. And so probably more than half the films are going to actually be from the Ar AV Geeks archive. Uh, she knows a lot about educational films. I would say that she and I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe as far as the films that we know um, and so she's going to show something at King's on the, and I'm sorry, at Alamo Draft House on the 19th, which is a Sunday. So go to the Alamo uh, website and get that information. Then I'm doing a show that Friday at Hunt Library, I think. Um, so, uh, and that's films about partying because <laughs> students are coming back to NC State. And so we wanted to show them cautionary films about partying. Um, let's see. So that's one way you can support us. Another way is you can go buy DVDs at the AV Geek site. Uh, you can donate to to uh, Patreon.com. Patreon.com is kind of like a subscription tip jar where you can donate just a little bit of money and put limitations on it and all that stuff. Um, because of, of Patreon, I've been able to buy new streaming equipment. Um, we tried to buy a webcam, but it was a piece of junk. Um, and other things so we're slowly upgrading and it's also giving us a budget to uh, not feel bad about spending more money on ebay on uh, educational films and the, i've been bidding on some just stupid stuff because i'm like oh well i got this money from patreon so yeah woo. um i get to get back to the the, the fun times um so that's what, another way to support but yeah just tell people about what we do um and then i'm doing another av geek show uh, at the Alamo, um, it's a computer show, films about computers, your brand new friend, the computer. So uh, if you go to AV Geeks on Facebook, you can see the events, uh, or if you go to the Alamo Draft House, you'll see events there for Alamo events. So, yes. All right, one last film, and, you know, we've traveled.
gone different ways by different means, different places, and we're exhausted, absolutely exhausted. And I've always had this theory, like the last leg of the trip is the worst, the slowest, the most excruciating. Even if it's the shortest, it's also it's so bad. So this film kind of captures that. It's called Welcome Back, Norman. Enjoy. Airports and parking lots, gee, but it's good to be home. Taxi cabs are waiting in line, appointments never start on time, pay telephones without a dime, it seems something should be a crime. Hotels and restaurants, airports and parking lots, gee, but it's good to be home. Welcome back, no. <laughs> Oh. 
Taxi cabs are waiting in line, appointments never start on time, pay telephones without a dime, it seems some things should be a crime, hotels and restaurants, airports and parking lots, gee, but it's good to be home, welcome back no. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so if I don't see you in person, I will see you um, via the Internet on September... What day did I say? The 9th? Wait, did I even say the 9th? I don't think I want to do the 9th. I think I'm going to have to change... We'll still show films about astronauts, but I think I'm going to have to do it on the 16th. What did I say? Look at my notes here. Yeah. Yeah, September 16th. We're going to do it. Sorry about that. Astronauts on September 16th. Uh, so if I don't see you before then, uh, I'll see you here. Uh, again, thanks so much for your support, so much for chiming in. It's nice to see um, familiar names and new names, um, people chiming in, watching this uh it's a hobby that's kind of turned into something just a little scooch bigger than um, a hobby. So, everybody have a good rest of the week, and um, we will see each other again soon. Take care.